Welcome to Calvary, everyone. It's wonderful to be with you as we come together to worship the Lord as one church in multiple different places. Join us live on Sundays at nine o'clock where you can chat live with others who are part of the Calvary Online community, get to be known and get to know other people as well. Another great way to get known at Calvary is to be in groups. If you're interested in joining a group with other people who are part of the Calvary Online community, you can sign up for a group anytime at calvarybible.com online. If there's something going on in your life that you would like prayer for, our staff is here for you. We pray over prayer requests every week along with our elders, and we want to invite you to share those prayers with us. You can fill out the online prayer request form anytime. You can also reach out if there's something happening in your life that you want to talk about with me or with John or someone else on the staff. Feel free to reach out to us anytime. We're here for you. We are for you, and we love you. Let's pause now to prepare our hearts to worship the Lord, to praise His name, and to lift Him high. Oh 
conquers Mighty river flowing upwards From a deep but empty grave I will praise you on the mountain I will praise you in the mountains and my way You're with the sun and where my feet are So I will praise you in the valleys all the same No lays God within the shadows No lays faithful when the night leads me astray You're with earth and where my feet Highlands and the Arctic are the same It's a joy for me to be here with you at Calvary Online as we continue in our series through the book of Hebrews, looking at the exaltation, the greatness of Jesus Christ. We're going to pick up right where we left off last week in chapter 5. So grab your Bibles, open up to chapter 5. We'll begin in verse 11. If you remember, the writer of Hebrews is writing to an audience that is susceptible to losing their faith or walking away from the community because of their present circumstances, sufferings, hardships that they're encountering because of the gospel. And the author is writing to them to encourage them to get their eyes on Jesus, the greater than angels, greater than priests, greater than our present circumstances, so that the greatness of God gets bigger and bigger and bigger in our mind. And then the problems and the hardships we're experiencing become smaller and smaller and smaller. And he's been warning this group of people not to harden their hearts, not to deafen their ears, not to drift away, but to, as we saw last week, hold fast, draw near the throne of grace to receive grace and mercy in their time of need. And so both there are these sobering warnings of what not to do, and then these inspirational encouragements of what we ought to do in order to hold fast our confession from beginning to end. And we're in another sober warning text. There was one a couple of weeks ago, and then it was followed by the word of encouragement last week, and, and then he completes this warning today. And so it's almost like a sandwich here that we're looking at, and we'll look at the second part, where he is concerned of their dullness, their sluggishness of hearing and receiving and acting on the words that they have heard. So come with me to Hebrews chapter 5, verse 11. He says, About this we have much to say, and it's hard to explain, since you have become dull of hearing. About what does he have much to say? Well, He has more to say about this topic that was just introduced just a few verses before in which he will actually unpack for the next several chapters, which is Jesus greater than the Levitical priesthood, those in the line of Aaron and his sons and their descendants from the tribe of Levi, this earthly priesthood that served in the temple, offering sacrifices that could never take away the sins of the people, but would cover them. And they want, he wants to unpack that Jesus is greater than Aaron and the priests because he is in a different line, a different lineage, which comes from the order of Melchizedek. And he wants to talk about Melchizedek, and we want to talk about Melchizedek, but he first has to address a problem, a concern, that they are dull, sluggish in hearing and receiving and acting on what has already been made known to them. So first he addresses this and says, I want to explain so much more, but you have become dull of hearing. Verse 12, for though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracle of God. 
You need milk, not solid food. For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, since he or they is a child. So he paints this picture of infancy and says, I want you to be a teacher by now, the things that you've heard. I want you to be on spiritual solid food, but I have to keep giving you milk like a mother gives a child, an infant, milk. You're unskilled in the word of righteousness or the word that leads to righteousness. I mean, unskilled is to be unexperienced. You are still a dependent. And I was hoping you would grow up by now and and be a contributor, but you're not. You're stuck because of the dullness of your hearing. Verse 14, but solid food is for the mature as they grow, as they're perfected. For those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. So that's our goal, is maturity on our way to perfection, so that we would move from being infants and dependents to being grown and beyond spiritual food and nourishment. And so in chapter 6, it opens with this word, therefore. Therefore, I don't want you to be dull. Therefore, I want you to grow up and grow into the works that lead to righteousness, the words that teach about righteousness and salvation. Therefore, because I don't want you or anyone here to miss on the salvation, miss out on the salvation that we've been talking about, let me warn you. Therefore, let us leave the elementary doctrine of Christ and go on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith towards God, and of instructions about washings, the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. So he says, okay, let's leave the elementary teachings so that we can hold on to, grasp what God is really talking about. Now, what are these elementary teachings? If we looked at what he describes here, would we consider them the elementary basic principles of faith? Are these the things that we talk about at kids at Calvary, repentance, eternal judgment, resurrection of dead, the laying on of hands. I don't know if we would consider them the simple, the simple basic principles of the faith. Nor would we say that they are exclusively Christian. Remember, he's writing to a group of people that are Jewish Christians. They're coming out of the Jewish faith and seeing that Jesus is the true Messiah. So these marks here, these elementary principles of repentance, faith, washings, laying on of hands, resurrection of the dead, are things that, well, the old covenant teaches about too. Remember, the whole context of this conversation is a prelude of him wanting to talk about Jesus as the greater than Aaron and his descendants. And so there's something in here where the people are stuck holding on to the things, the elementary things of the past, and are unwilling to let go to grasp onto the things of Christ, the new covenant. Now, where would we get that in this conversation? Well, we would get that as where it goes in Hebrews. We don't have to go very far. Is that we actually can go to over here to Hebrews chapter 9, talking about these same markers as attributes of the first covenant the earthly temple priests that could never really bring about the salvation that God intended. And so look over here at Hebrews chapter 9, verse 8. It says, By this the Holy Spirit indicates that the way into the holy place is not yet opened as long as the first section is still standing. As long as the old covenant still stands, as long as we hold on to the old covenant, then we don't have full access to God According to this arrangement, this first covenant, the Levitical priests of Aaron, gifts and sacrifices are offered that cannot perfect, or the same word, mature, the conscience of the worshiper, but deal only with food and drink and various washings. Regulations for the body imposed until the time of reformation. That's the reformation that Jesus comes to bring, the fulfillment, moving from the old covenant to This is a new covenant established in my blood. No longer the ceremonial washings. No longer the laying hands on animal sacrifices. No longer about repentance coming to the temple, but repentance coming through Jesus. This is what they're still holding on to. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 1 simply says, For since the law 
has but a shadow of the good things to come instead of the true form of these realities, it can never, by the same sacrifices that are continually offered every year, make perfect, mature, those who draw near. As the writer of Hebrews, I think, is specifically talking to not yet believers who come from their long lineage of Jewish roots, who have yet to hold fast unto Jesus Christ. Look again at an interesting word here in chapter 6. It says, therefore, let us leave. It doesn't say, therefore, okay, let's, let's build on the foundation that was laid, these basic principles of Christianity. He says, let us leave. This word means to depart, to expire, to give up on, to keep no longer. When New Testament authors want to talk about divorce, they use this same word. And so it can't simply be these are the basic principles of Christianity we wish you would build upon. No, these are principles of the old covenant law and the practice of priests that the author is saying you need to leave and depart from. Not depart from the whole Old Testament, the whole covenant, but that you would depart and hold fast to Jesus. That you would hold fast to what Christ has come to fulfill. This word elementary is not simply the, the basic simplistic principles of faith, because these are not the simplest things to talk about, but they are the beginning parts. How did God begin to reveal himself? By calling a people through Abraham and through his offspring, establishing priests and a people, a covenant with them. Those are the beginning, the elementary principles. How has he spoken now in these last days? Well, Hebrew says, through his son now. And so we must respond to the son's message, to the son's work, and hold fast to what he has come to fulfill. Then he goes on, chapter 6, verse 4. For it is impossible in the case of those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift and have shared in the Holy Spirit and have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the age to come and then have fallen away to restore them again to repentance since they are crucifying once again the Son of God to their own harm and holding up to or holding him up to contempt. Now you might say, well, well this sounds like it's describing a believer here. Is this really an unbelieving Jew who has yet to embrace Christ fully? Aren't these not marks of a true disciple of Jesus? And some will people argue that these are really marks of, of Christians who have the opportunity to fall away or lose their salvation. But what's, what we do know here in this community is that there probably are some, like any church, who have full faith believers and also have others who are experiencing the full faith of those believers. What this community is not, this is not the community in Athens in which Paul says, I see that you're religious, but you have no real knowledge of God, so let me speak to you about that. This community is not like the Ethiopian eunuch in which Philip says, I see that you have an interest in things of God, but you have no understanding, and so let me describe these things to you. No, this community that he's speaking to has the understanding and the knowledge of God in which they have yet to fully embrace. And so these characteristics are true, of Christians, but they can also be true of those who are simply near the benefits and experience of those who are walking as Christians. Look at this. They've been enlightened, which means that they have some knowledge of God. They have tasted the heavenly gift. What's, what is the heavenly gift? It's, it's probably not the Holy Spirit because he mentions the Holy Spirit next, but the gift of, of God's revelation, the gift of his kindness, the gift of his knowledge of repentance, They've tasted the goodness of the word and its powers. I still think he's talking about not yet believers. These are almost the same descriptions that he described this community prior in chapter 2 and calling them not to neglect this great salvation because they were in a place of drifting away from it and not responding, kind of the same situation. And he's trying to encourage them to embrace it, cling to it. So go back with me to Hebrews chapter 2. Verse 1, he's previously said, therefore, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard. The reason is because Jesus is greater than the angels bring a greater message 
than the angels, so we have to pay closer attention to what we've heard from the Son of God, lest we drift away from it, neglect it, and abandon salvation. Look at verse 3. How shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? They're in danger of not embracing faith. It was declared at first by the Lord, and it was attested to us by those who heard. While God also bore witness by signs and wonders and various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit, distributing according to his will. So you're describing people that are rubbing shoulders in a community in which they've heard the message. They've seen the wonders of God. They've tasted and seen the gifts from heaven, even the Holy Spirit, and yet have failed to embrace it, to cling to it, to come to saving faith in Jesus Christ. Now, what is this warning? This is for those who are in this community that have been enlightened, that have tasted and shared and seen the goodness of God, to walk away limits you, prohibits you from ever coming to repentance. Some people would say, okay, this is actually the text that teaches you can lose your salvation. Is that that what's happening here? That you can lose your salvation if once you were a believer and now you are not? Well, first and foremost, that would neglect just the teachings of Jesus Christ. It would neglect the teachings of Christ when he talks about a prodigal son, who belonged to the household of the father and for a season rejected the father and left. But then in repentance came home and was received back to the father. This would neglect the teachings of Christ when he speaks about Peter. Peter, you're going to deny me three times. But what does he say? After you return, strengthen your brother. So he knows even in his denying and rejecting of Christ, he is going to return, that God will bring him to return. And he has work for him to do. This would neglect the the teachings that Jesus is the good shepherd in John chapter 10. John chapter 10 simply says, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one will be able to snatch them out of the father's hand. I and the father are one. That's talking about the security of our salvation. So what of this text in Hebrews that if we fall away, there is no longer repentance for us? Well, think of it this way. Every doorway, every door kind of has two sides to it. One says enter, one says exit. On one side, it says push. The other side, it says pull. In our faith, when we enter, the doorway is labeled repentance. On God's side, as he receives, the doorway is labeled forgiveness. Which side of the doorway is closed here? Is it God's side? saying that people will come in repentance and say, Father, forgive me. Father, I have wandered. Father, I've done things I shouldn't have done. I have denied you. I have rejected you. Please forgive me. And he says, no, I will not forgive you. Is that the side of the door that's closed here? It's not, is it? Which side is it? It's the side of repentance. This is similar to what he's already said in the letter, that if we drift, if we deafen our ear and not listen. If we get all tied up in sins that harden our hearts, if we are dull to hearing, we can get ourselves in a place that we will never seek repentance. That as God calls out to us saying, come, come, I have forgiveness for you. We say in our hearts, never, I'll never come. I'll never repent. That is the danger of being dull or sluggish in our hearing, is that one day we get to a place that we would never seek repentance. But the scriptures always teach that those who want to repent and come to the Lord, no matter what they have done, if they seek repentance, he is faithful to forgive. And so this is a warning text of our own hearts that we would be a part of a community 
that has seen and tasted and shared so much of the goodness of God, but never gave our faith to it, never embraced Christ, and finally get to a place where we are actually never willing to seek repentance. He then illustrates this in an agricultural example that would have been familiar of the day. Jesus used many agricultural examples. Here in verse 7, the author says, For land that has drunk the rain often falls on it and produces a crop useful to those whose sake it is cultivated, receives a blessing from God. But if it bears thorns and thistles, it is worthless and near to being cursed, and it is in its end is to be burned. So this is the description of people in this church in which the word is preached every Sunday, in which signs and wonders are done, in which they share in the Holy Spirit's goodness. They share with one another, believers in this community, but have never truly surrounded their life to Christ through repentance. And they're like these lands that both received the rain and one, by faith, produced a crop. Another, because it lacked any faith, produced thorns and thistles. And in the end, as we talk about eternal judgment, are burned up. That's what the warning's about. And for you, Christian, who says, I've been going to church, that's what makes me a Christian. And for you, Christian, who says, yo, my parents were Christians. Or a young Christian, say, my, 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 my parents have a great faith. Or my grandparents have a great faith. This could just be a sober warning out of love to you to take time and ask, have you ever surrendered your life and come to Christ and made that decision for yourself? That's what we're called to. Here we don't probably have Jewish believers in our community that are holding on to old covenant and refusing to lay hands on Jesus. But I think we have nominal Christians, not yet believing Christians, who have experienced the goodness of God and have yet to surrender their life to Christ. We also have in our community loved ones. I have loved ones, family members that are in a season of wandering that have turned away from God. What, what hope do we have that they'll return? Well, I think that the scriptures lay out several hopes for us, specifically here in Hebrews, the hope of today, that it's not the end yet. Our faith is built in its beginning, is at work in its present, and we don't know how it ends yet for them. And so we want to be praying for them loving them, drawing near to them, that the kindness of our own life, the ways in which we serve them, perhaps can soften their hardness of heart, that they would return to repentance and receive a willing Father's forgiveness. Check out chapter 4, verse 1 of Hebrews. We looked at this a few weeks ago. It says, Therefore, while the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us fear lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it. The promise of entering his rest it still stands today, today. And so we don't give up hope on anyone. I have great hope that as long as that promise still stands, and it still stands today, there is a call today. If you hear his voice today, if you hear my voice about this passage, do not be dull of hearing, but embrace the saving work of Jesus Christ today, today. For the promise of entering his rest, his salvation, is still available. Then he goes on in verse 9, turning the corner. I think now he's speaking to those he, he sees as believers in the community. It says, though we speak in this way, this, this sober warning, yet in your case, beloved, a title to believers, beloved, we feel sure of better things, that you're, you're not going to miss the opportunity, that you are going to cling to Christ. Better things that lead, that belong to salvation. Beloved, I see that you're in salvation. For God is not unjust so as to overlook your works and the love that you have shown for his name in serving the saints as you still do. He points out the fruitfulness of their life. Remember, rains came down on the lands. One produced fruit. One of the marks of a disciple, Jesus tells us, is how we love one another. He says, God, God sees how you have loved the saints in the past. That's a fruitful life. That you are loving the saints presently. 
That's a mark of the fruit of your life. And then he encourages them, future, till the end. Continue to do this. Verse 11, and we desire each one of you to show the same earnestness, eagerness, willingness to have the full assurance of hope until the end so that you may not be sluggish. There's that dull of hearing, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promise. Now we speak to them, beloved, I, have be- I know of better things for you. I see that the rain has come down on the soils of your life and it's producing fruitfulness in the past, today, and now my encouragement is this, continue, continue. True faith is persevering faith. Continue in it and holding fast to the assurance of hope. He uses this word assurance twice in the book of Hebrews. Later, he'll use it in chapter 10, or sorry, chapter 11, where he speaks about that faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Biblical Christian hope is not the same as worldly hope. When we say we hope in the world, we say, I hope they win the game. I hope the plane arrives on time. And the reason we say we hope is because there's a sense that it might not come true. There is uncertainty. And so we use the word hope in the world. That's not how the Bible uses hope. The way the Bible uses hope is the assurance, the certainty, the confidence, because hope is deposited in a person, this Jesus Christ. And so how can we have the assurance of hope when it feels like our faith is failing? When we feel like we are dwindling or drifting away, you need examples in your life. How to hold on, how to be fast. You you lean into the community. And that's about what he's going to do next week. He's going to turn the corner and say, hold fast to the assurance of hope, just like Abraham. Abraham did this. Let me walk you through how Abraham had this assurance of hope. And that's what we're going to look at next week. Two marks of Abraham's life to leave you with today are this, from the final verse, so that you may not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promise. What did Abraham have? What did the great saints have? What can you have? Is faith, that's trust. Continue to trust him. Even when you don't see how it's all working out, continue to trust and be patient. Like the agricultural example, patience is needed. Over time, these things happen. It's not manufactured. It's not dropped off your faith from an Amazon drone. It is cultivated, grown through two things, trust and patience. And that's what I want you to have today as we evaluate living in a community in which we have generously been enlightened, tasted, seen, and shared Have you believed? And if you have, God will not overlook your works in the past, what you're doing today, and encourage you to continue with trust and patience till the very end. Hold fast to Christ.
interposed his precious blood. Mount of thy redeeming 